it was an unfortunate event, but to tell you the truth, to me it was a, a mere bauble, a trinket. I had it replaced for my wife the very next day. And nothing else was stolen? Not a thing, and it appeared there'd been no search. Mr. Clarendon appears to be a frequent depositor. Yes, but it looks as if he's afraid the money will burn a hole in his bank book if he leaves it in too long. Who are you and what do you want? Dr. John Watson, sir. I wondered if you might be kind enough to answer a few questions. About what? <clears throat> Guy Clarendon. <laughs> that welching little weasel, what about him? He's been murdered. Ah! I'd say he got what he deserved. And if you don't clear out of here in two seconds, so will you. Oh, quite. Ta-ta. This is a difficult thing for a man to say about his only son. But Guy was a wastrel and a ne'er-do-well. Only a short month or so ago, I gave him 5,000 pounds and told him that was the last he'd see of my money. I'd hoped the shock would bring the boy around, make him realize he had to settle down instead of wasting his life on gambling and gallivanting around with that wild woman. Which wild woman was that? Loretta Nolan, of course. You mentioned gambling, Sir Francis. Have you any idea with whom he gambled or who might have wanted to kill him? I wish I did. He told us nothing. He only came around when he needed money. And when I told him there'd be no more, we never saw him. Just about broke his mother's heart. <laughs> there, there, Gertie. We still have one another. I've something you ought to know about Master Guy. One morning, rather early, about four or five weeks ago, I heard a terrible clatter downstairs, so I came down to investigate. It was Master Guy just coming home. He was in a terrible state, all battered and bruised, with a fresh cut on his forehead. I asked him who did it to him, and he wouldn't say. I think he was afraid for his life. <laughs> So, sorry to have kept you waiting, gentlemen. Mm. I assume you are inquiring about the Nolan girls? Yes, we are. How long have you been there, solicitor, Mr. Davenport? Actually, in practice, I am serving that function only for Francis. Loretta has not sought a word of my advice since she came of age and was able legally to get her hands on her trust fund. Had Loretta the presence of mind to follow my good counsel, I'm certain she would be in a far better financial situation today. Do you recall a meeting with Miss Francis last month when she blacked out? Well, I did have a very odd meeting with both Miss Francis and Miss Loretta several weeks ago. How so? Well, I wouldn't say she blacked out as such, but she did leave rather unexpectedly. We were in the middle of our discussion when I was called out of the office. I was gone not more than 20 minutes. When I returned, Miss Francis had a very strange look in her eyes. She mumbled something and promptly left. Miss Loretta laughed that very disturbing laugh of hers and departed as well. My husband, God rest his soul, gave me that necklace for our 50th wedding anniversary. And woe betide the blighter that took it, I say. I can certainly understand your consternation, madam. May I assume that you were out the evening it was taken? Oh, yes. The house was completely empty. Sybil, my housekeeper, and I were attending the mass charity ball at St. Mary's for the benefit of unwed mothers. It wouldn't surprise me if that scoundrel was responsible in that direction as well. Society burglar, indeed. He's of the lower classes, mark my words. Do you keep your jewels locked up? Oh, I keep them in a very secret place. 
a box made to look like a copy of Great Expectations on the bookshelf amidst the other books. Hiram, my late husband, thought of that. But the thief went right to it. Well, Watson, will Alice see us now? Not likely, Holmes. He's on assignment in Istanbul. Do you remember a woman who came in recently and purchased a Derringer? Oh, matter of fact, I do, sir. We don't get women in here very often, especially not alone. And I particularly remember that one because she was so pretty and, uh... She looked like she really knew how to have a good time, if you'll pardon the expression. Do you remember her name? I should say I do. She repeated it twice whilst I was filling out the order form. Seems like it was very important to her that I get her name right. Let me see, it was um, Francis nor uh, Les... Uh, well, well, it was Francis something or other, sir. <laughs> I understand that Wilfred Robards is considering taking Miss Nolan's case. He might be able to help you. If you'd like, I can arrange an interview with Frances Nolan. She's being held downstairs, you know. We might be able to help you, Miss Nolan, if you could just remember what happened that night in Mr. Clarendon's room. Well, that's just the trouble. I can't remember anything except seeing Guy's body across the room and the pistol in my hand. Where did you get the pistol? I've no idea, though the police assure me it's mine. I didn't know Guy was at Halliday's. I've never even been there before. And why would I shoot him anyway? We loved each other. There, there, <laughs> Miss Nolan. Stiff up a lip. Thank you. Miss Nolan, what is the last thing you remember before the room at Halliday's? Oh... Hot cocoa in bed. I beg your pardon? Oh. Well, every night before I retire, my maid, Grace, brings me a cup of hot cocoa. How nice. Oh, yes. And before that? Well, before that, I dine with Dr. Trevelyan, as I do every Sunday evening. My sister, Loretta, is under his care. The doctor and I have become good friends over the years. He left at 10 o'clock, as he always does. May I ask, where did you first meet Guy Clarendon? The country estate of Cornelius Oldwine, in March. My sister Loretta was attending a party there. I suppose things got a bit out of hand because it seemed she dived into a fountain. She caught pneumonia and I had to go and fetch her home. Guy was also at the estate, and that's where we met. And he immediately began paying court to you? Oh, heavens no. Nobody seems to take much notice of me. I suppose that comes from having such a wildly attractive sister. That's why I was so surprised when he called a few weeks later. We began seeing a great deal of each other. We went on long carriage rides, had picnic lunches. It was all quite lovely. And then on the 5th of June, he declared his love for me and asked for my hand in marriage. I was so happy. I couldn't have killed him. How do you explain your presence at Halliday's? Well, I can't. It's just like the other two times. You've had memory losses before. <laughs> yes, twice in the past month. The first time I found myself atop a horse in Hyde Park with no recollection of how I got there. The last thing I remember was having lunch with my sister Loretta. Then there I was, atop a chestnut mare. How peculiar. The funny thing is, I'm terrified of horses. You mentioned there was a second time. Yes, a few days later, I met with my solicitor, Hiram Davenport. Then the next thing I know, I'm at the Newgate Street Station. I consulted my physician, Dr. Mason, and he was quite as baffled as I was. One last question, if you will. What is your relationship with Gerald Locke? Oh, Jerry, he's a dear old friend. Though I'm afraid we had a falling out of late. He said some very unkind words about Guy.
my wife and I were guests at a small dinner party at the home of Otis Richmond. We arrived home sometime after midnight, and as my wife was putting away her finery, she noticed the bracelet was missing from a jewelry box, and we summoned the police immediately. The servants were questioned. Oh, they've all been with us for a number of years, and I haven't the slightest suspicion about them. But yes, the police did question them thoroughly. All were in bed asleep by the time we arrived home, and none heard anything untoward. And nothing else was taken? Surprisingly not. Yet you are positive that the bracelet has not simply been misplaced? No, my wife actually put it on while she was preparing for the evening, and then she decided against it. I saw her put it back in the box. Where does she keep the box? In her dressing table, there's a special compartment in the side of it. The box fits in rather neatly. Well, the Clarendon murders look fairly open and shut, if you ask me. Not your typical murderers, I admit, but there you have it. Clarendon, poor chap. He arrived on the 29th day of May and was given a front room on the third floor. Two days later, he asked to be moved to suite 205. To your knowledge, did he have any visitors? Only two that I'm aware of. One was a most disagreeable fellow. He was rather large, had a thick walrus moustache and a very prominent scar down his cheek. He arrived on the 1st of June, well, the very day of Mr. Clarendon's move. He simply came in, sat down in the lobby and waited. Twenty minutes or so later, Mr. Clarendon came down from his room. The big man yanked him aside. I was about to send for a bobby when Mr. Clarendon signed me that all was well. After a few minutes, they left together. I never saw the man again. His other visitor, who came by quite frequently, was a most striking woman. She was quite fashionably dressed. She had a most <laughs> distinctive laugh, very full and deep. I've no idea who she was. Please, tell us about the morning of July 2nd. It was about nine o'clock when a woman entered. She was rather plain looking and I wouldn't have noticed her, except for the fact that she came in the front door looking neither left nor right and proceeded directly up the staircase. It couldn't have been more than 30 seconds later when I heard a bang followed by a woman's scream. I dashed upstairs to the second floor. The door to room 205 was open. Inside, I found the body of Mr. Clarendon and the woman who'd just come up. She was lying in a swoon in the center of the room with a pistol in her hand. I revived her with some whiskey. When she came to, she was totally disoriented. She had no idea where she was or what she'd done. When she saw Clarendon's body, she let out a shriek and dropped the pistol. I summoned the police. Tell me, at what hour are the hotel's front doors locked? Oh, ten o'clock, sir. Hmm. Anyone who arrives after that has to be let in by the night staff. Of course, Mr. Clarendon was never one of those. He was always in his room before ten. May we see his room? What do we hear, Watson? It appears to be a bank statement. Well, look here, Holmes. It appears that the maid missed a spot in a sweeping. Good thing she did, Watson. You're staring at evidence. Hmm. Blood. What's this stain here? Smells like a fine sherry. Looks like someone's been celebrating. The question is, was it with the body or over it? Nothing much here. A couple of shirts and uh, three pair of shoes. But what you failed to notice, my dear Watson, is that one of the pairs of shoes is canvas and has been dyed black. Interesting. A sweater and trousers. An ensemble in black. Not much of a view. All I can see is a brick wall of the building across the alley. Hmm. Ivy Vines binding up a trellis. It's all quite upsetting, you know. The pendant belonged to my great-great-grandmother, and I was hoping to pass it on to my daughter. 
Now it's gone. There, there, Mrs. Judge, you mustn't worry. With Holmes and I on the case, we're sure to recover your pendant. Uh, by the way, where did you keep it when you weren't wearing it? In the toe of my old black button-ups. And I don't recall ever having mentioned that to anyone. Or at least I don't think I did. Any luck? Yes and no. I beg your pardon? Yes, Kilgore has met Clarendon once or twice, but no, he insists he's never heard of Calvin Leach. And you believed him? The tiara was a terribly valuable piece of jewellery, and it meant so much to my wife. She has been under a doctor's care since the theft. In fact, just yesterday, she took a room at the hospital. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Is she prone to bouts of nervousness? Mm, perhaps lately it seems so. She was absolutely undone when young Clarendon poured champagne down the bodice of her gown at Richmond's party. Come to think of it, that was the last time she wore her tiara. She was so proud of it. And several of the ladies at that party admired it openly. Where did Lady Leeds keep the tiara when she wasn't wearing it? In the bottom drawer of her bureau, where she kept some of her more frilly undergarments. Were there any signs of a search? Drawers left open, that sort of thing? No, and that's what strikes me as so peculiar. It's as if the burglar knew right where to look. Why even trouble yourself with this one, Holmes? You believe Francis Nolan to be guilty? <laughs> guilty as a cat would swallow a canary. And on what do you base that brilliant deduction? Look, Francis Nolan claims not to have known that Clarendon was residing at Halliday's. Yet she proceeded directly to his room where she shot the bloke. She claims not to have owned a gun. Yet the gun found in her hand was purchased at S. Goff and the receipt had her name on it, for Christ's sake. No, that little lady will never see the light of day again. We were at a reception at Buckingham Palace for the new head of the China delegation. Upon arriving home, my wife discovered that her favorite ruby earrings were missing. We noticed nothing else out of place. No sign of a search, that is. And none of the servants had heard anything suspicious. We have just a few more questions for you, Mr. Locke, if you don't mind. Of course not. Anything to help Francis. We were wondering if you could shed some light on Miss Francis' relationship with Guy Clarendon. He was only after her money. I tried to tell Frances as much, but she wouldn't hear of it. We had a bit of a row over it. I've been quite upset about the whole thing. Upset enough to commit murder? What an outrageous accusation. It was only a question, Mr. Locke. Preposterous. Besides, I've been on holiday all week, playing cribbage at the annual tournament up at Leeds. Sounds positively riveting. Oh, it was. <laughs> The Mesmer Braid Institute was founded in 1874 as an asylum for the mentally disturbed. Oh, perhaps she's a bit of a loony. Quite so. The institute was named after the 17th century Austrian physician Anton Mesmer, who first discovered a technique whereby he could induce a quiet trance-like state in patients. Sounds suspiciously like hypnosis. Actually, he called it mesmerism. It says that he ascribed certain mystic qualities to his process and so was largely discredited during his lifetime. In the 1840s, Dr. James Braid, an Englishman, became interested in Mesmer's work, refined the process, and renamed it Hypnotism. Right you are, Holmes. Tell us, Dr. Mason, have you determined the cause of Francis Nolan's blackouts? It's the strangest thing, really. I examined her thoroughly and found nothing physically wrong. 
She could not recall receiving a bump in the head, nor did she complain of dizziness. All I could suggest that was perhaps she was overtired and prescribed rest. It remains a complete mystery to me. You're quite sure the murder weapon was a small caliber pistol? Quite. I'd also wager to say he'd been shot at very close range. Ghastly. Tell us, Sir Jasper, at what time did you receive the body? Uh, around uh, one o'clock in the afternoon. And how much time would you judge to have elapsed from the time of the murder? Well, it's always difficult to be precise in these matters, but I'd venture to say he'd been dead anywhere from four to ten hours. <clears throat> uh, I say, excuse me, Dr. Murray. Oh, hello. What? Oh, my, I must have dozed off. Ah, it's you, Whitson. And what are you doing with yourself this afternoon? Or is it evening already? Have I missed my tea? It's Watson, sir. We're looking into the Clarendon case, and we were wondering... The Clarendon? Ah, I just finished that report when I dozed off. Let me see. Number 301, I believe. Ah, yes. Here it is. Hmm. Number 103. Clarendon, guy. Uh, not much, I'm afraid. A hole in the shirt where a small caliber bullet passed into the body. Extensive blood stain. Uh, powder burns, indicating a close-range shot. Ah, here's something interesting. On the lower part of the shirt, I found traces of alcohol. Uh, wine, to be exact. Now, I have a good nose for this sort of thing, and I believe it to be an inferior quality Italian red. Tell us... Who was at home on the evening of the first? Well, just Miss Frances, sir. Oh, yes, of course, and Dr. Trevelyan. At what time did the doctor take his leave? Oh, let me think. It. Oh, it must have been 10 o'clock, because that's what time he always leaves. What did Miss Frances do after her guest left? What she does every evening, sir. Well, she asked for a cup of hot cocoa, which I brought her straight away. Then she read for a bit by the fire. Later, when I went up to bed, I passed her room and the light went out. What time would that have been? Oh, let me see. Oh, I know it was 11.30 because the clock chimed. Then I went to sleep. Later, I was awakened in the middle of the night, right in the midst of the most peculiar dream. You see, I was barefoot and trying to buy a pair of shoes as and... As fascinating as all this is, could we get back to what it was that awakened you? Oh, yes, of course. Uh -huh. Well, it was something that I heard, or thought I heard. I listened for a bit, but that was the end of it, so I went to sleep again. Later, I awoke at 7.30. I always wake up at 7.30, except, of course, on Sundays when I sleep until 8. Mm. As usual, I began to prepare Miss Frances's breakfast. I had no sooner got into the kitchen when I heard the front door open and close. Well, I ran to the front window and peeked out, and... There was Miss Frances walking down the street. And why do you deem that so unusual? Well, she never leaves before she's eaten one of my currant buns. Enter and be recognized. <laughs> Oh, you don't wish to play Her Majesty, eh? Very well. You do not seem particularly disturbed by the recent turn of events, Miss Nolan. Each of us grieves in his own way, Mr. Holmes. It must be difficult for you to face the possibility that your own sister may have killed your dearest chum. Guy was fun to be with. And as for Francis, I love her dearly, but, well, it's funny to think Miss Wright and Proper has finally gotten herself into a bit of a jam. Miss Nolan, may I ask, when was the last time you saw Guy Clarendon? Let me think. I believe it was 
The Richmond's party last Thursday. Yes, I'm sure of it. God, we did cut it up a bit there. <laughs> and after the party? We did not go home together, if that's what you're implying. That would have broken Frances's heart. She was head over heels for Guy, you know. She had some foolish notion that he was going to marry her. Not that someone like him ever would. But I do recall her saying, and it might have been the night of his death, that she was going to have a talk with him about their future. Both Loretta Nolan and Guy Clarendon have had several complaints filed against them, although neither of them has ever been arrested. Both have been cited for public drunkenness. Likewise, both have been involved in some unusual pranks, but no one has ever pressed charges. Poor old guy. He could be such fun. I'll never forget what a jolly good time we had the night he climbed the fountain at my country estate. How acrobatic. You don't know the half of it. It all started with Loretta, it seemed those things always did. Anyway, someone dared her to jump into the fountain. It being March and quite chilly, no one actually thought she would. She did the one better. She jumped straight in and swam to the center, where I have this absolutely dreadful sculpture with a lot of fat water nymphs. It rises some 20 or 30 feet in the air. She climbed it, though. The woman must be part monkey. Then she dove in. After that, it seemed to be the thing to do, so everybody took the plunge. I was the only other one who actually climbed to the top of the fountain, though. By the end of the weekend, half my guests came down with sneezes. Loretta caught pneumonia. It appears as though Guy and Loretta, the terrible twins, will afflict us no more. Loretta must be desolate, what with the loss of a kindred spirit and fellow prankster. Prankster? Well, yes, my good fellow. I'll never forget the time. Clarendon poured champagne down the front of Lady Leeds's new Paris gown for the sole purpose of Loretta's amusement. I would think she must also be distraught at the loss of her lover, not to mention the imprisonment of her sister. Well, I'm not sure about Loretta's feelings toward her sister, but I do know that Guy and Loretta were not lovers. Though outwardly they made an excellent couple, he tall, handsome, and from a moneyed family, and she, beautiful, and an heiress in her own right. Yes, it would have been a match made in heaven. But it was a match made in far hotter regions, I suspect. Francis claims that she and Clarendon were engaged to be married. Well, that's hard to imagine him being who he is, or was, as it were. Why do you say that? Well, Guy Clarendon was not at all a desirable sort. He'd all but been disowned by his own father for his compulsive gambling. The utter disregard for other people's money is probably what drew Clarendon and Loretta Nolan together in the first place. After all, she had managed to fritter away almost her entire fortune, unlike her sister Frances, who still had her inheritance, if not her honor, intact. Oh, that explains it. What are you driving at, Holmes? From all I've heard of Clarendon, I suspect his interest in Frances was directed toward her sizable bank account. Sure, I remember Clarendon. He and his lady friend used to stop in here from time to time. Usually on their way to Kilgore's gaming parlor or coming back from it. Rumor has it... Clarendon was in to kill Gore for a sizable sum. Do you happen to know how much? Seven thousand pounds was the figure I heard. Got to the point Kilgore wouldn't allow him in the door. Clarendon made a big fuss till Gus Bullock stepped in. Clarendon backed down pretty quick. Don't blame him none. Nobody in their right mind would want to mess with the likes of Gus. Do you think Bullock was involved in the murder? Nothing you could tell me about that bloke would surprise me. Anyways, Kilgore makes it clear to Clarendon that he wants his money. Then, a month or so later, Clarendon comes in all smiles, and he and Kilgore getting on like chums. Figure Clarendon must have paid him back. 
Then, Calvin Leach steps into the picture. Now, who's Calvin Leach? Leach deals in what you might call stolen property. Square dealer, too, give you one half the value of the article. What does Leach have to do with Clarendon and Kilgore? Usually nothing at all. But there it is. Leach, Kilgore and Clarendon meeting late at night just as thick as thieves. The meetings continued on right up to, well, the night before Clarendon's death. Very interesting. Now, we've been standing here jawing, and I don't recall hearing anybody order nothing. What'll it be, mate? At first, I thought it must have been one of the servants. After all, there was no sign of a search, and nothing else was disturbed. Did you question them? Thoroughly, but none of them would admit a thing. It really wasn't until Hardinge and Bessie Durth were robbed, and the newspapers referred to us as victims of the society burglar, that I was certain it wasn't any of my staff. By the way, can you recommend a good housekeeper and valet? Have you ever met Miss Frances Nolan? Only briefly. She wishes me to take her case. And have you decided? Actually, I'm quite up to my ears in several other pressing cases already. Oh. Anything I might have heard of? Oh, probably. Cornelius Oldwine is suing the sculptor who absolutely butchered his statue of Aphrodite. Oh, how terribly unnerving. You know, I once commissioned a painting Not... of Aphrodite. Now, Watson, I think we'd best be going. Their father, Sir Malcolm, left them each a one-sixth share. Several years ago, as soon as she came of age, Miss Loretta divested herself of her stock. It seems Sir Malcolm left his entire estate to his wife, Margaret. If she should precede him in death... Or accompany him, as proved to be the case. Yes. Uh, then the estate was to be equally divided between his two daughters, Frances and Loretta. The estate included a one-third share in the Aberdeen Navigation Company. Doctor... We understand that you dined with Francis Nolan on the evening of July 1st. Yes, that is correct. We dine every Sunday. Her sister Loretta has been under my care for some ten years. First at the Mesmer Braid Institute and then in private practice. Without breaching physician-patient protocol, would you mind telling us the nature of her illness? She never quite recovered from the overwhelming trauma of watching her parents being blown to bits. I quite understand. As is often the case with young orphans, they tend to create fantasies about their parents. Miss Loretta Nolan truly believes that her father was the King of England, making her a princess. Do you think her unconventional behavior stems from that fantasy? Absolutely. As a princess, she believes she can do no wrong. I must say that she's worlds apart from her sister Frances. Do you know Frances Nolan well? Yes, rather. Through my treatment of her sister, I've known her for years. Let me say that it is difficult to believe that Miss Frances is capable of murder. She has a quiet, unassuming personality. An act of such direct confrontation would not be at all in keeping with her character. Were Loretta and Frances close? I know without a doubt that Miss Frances loves and cares for her sister, almost as a parent would a child. Miss Loretta, well, she loves her sister as much as she is capable of love. 